Geography Unit 2 on Population. This is video 2.1. Why measure population? We study the population because it's critically important for three very specific reasons. More people are alive at this time, over 7 billion people, than any other point in Earth's long history. Second reason being that the world's population has increased at a faster rate during the second half of the 20th century than ever before in history. Third reason is that virtually all global population growth is concentrated in what we call LDCs or least developed countries. Least developed countries, as opposed to most developed countries, are a division that geographers make and there's various shared characteristics such as low per capita income, low literacy rates, low television numbers per household, and low hospital beds per capita that distinguish regions of most developed countries, or MDCs, from those of LDCs, or least developed countries. Least developed countries is where most of the population growth is occurring. We see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Middle East, and parts of Western Asia. Geographers can help us understand population patterns to understand why population is growing so rapidly in some areas and not so rapidly in others. Population patterns look at things like density, that's the people per square mile. The rates of change of population. Rates of change are measured through birth rates, death rates, fertility rates, infant mortality, life expectancy, and so on. Population patterns also help us provide an accurate picture for the future at planning for resources, buildings, schools, infrastructure, etc. And furthermore, population patterns help us understand globalization as it is occurring at a rapid rate. Geographers and scientists alike study what we call demography. Demography is a scientific study of population characteristics. Demographers look statistically at how people are distributed spatially and by age, gender, occupation, fertility, health, and so on and forth, so forth. So demography is really the study of certain indicators that determine the makeup of a particular human population. An example is this map of Canada, bilingualism, that's people who speak more than one, so bi meaning two, lingual meaning language in Canada. We see that the darker the color, the more people, the greater percentage of the population with knowledge of both English and French, since a lot of what Eastern Canada was colonized by the French. We see that specific areas of Canada have a higher concentration of people speaking both English and French, and then we have little pop-outs specifically of Montreal, a city that is mostly French speaking, and this is an example of demography and the study of certain indicators that determine the makeup of a particular human population. So demography studies certain indicators, there are many, one is bilingualism, another is population density and distribution to help understand the human population in a certain area. Pop population density is measured by taking the population and dividing it by the land area of the size you're measuring and you get population density. The higher the number, the more densely populated the area is. The lower the number, obviously the less densely populated the area is. What is the population density of Nevada? So if we take Nevada, if we take the entire population of Nevada and divide it by the size of the land that Nevada's borders occupy, we get the population density. So we see that the population of Nevada is 2.7 million people. We divide it by 110 square thousand miles and we get a population density of just 24 people per square mile in Nevada. Well, if we look a little bit closer at the distribution, that distribution isn't the same. There aren't 24 people per square mile in all of Nevada. It could be different in certain areas, specifically Las Vegas. So if we look at Las Vegas, we take its entire population, which is 583,000 people, divided by its land area, which is 135 square miles, and we get 4,298 people of population density in Las Vegas. So these numbers aren't the same. So how do we get those two numbers to reconcile? Well, we don't. We're measuring two very specific land sizes. Here it's 110 square thousand miles. Here it's simply just 135 square miles. So we have to look at the land and the population to look at the true population density of an area. The population density helps us understand the population distribution. So for example, by looking at these two numbers, we see the population distribution of Nevada is not even. In some areas, it's as low as 24 people per square mile, or perhaps even lower. In some areas, it's as high as 4,000 people per square mile. So density helps us understand distribution. Distribution is the spread of people in a specific area. 
If we look at a map of Nevada, we see the population per square mile from the Census Bureau. So most of Nevada has less than one person per square mile because there are vast parts of Nevada that are desert. However, there are some areas of Nevada, specifically Las Vegas, as well as the Reno Lake Tahoe area that have a higher population density. So therefore, we can assume that the population distribution of Nevada is not uniform or similar throughout the entire state. It has small pockets of more densely populated areas and pockets of higher densely populated areas. So Nevada is an example of an extreme population distribution in the United States, but there are even more extremes in the entire world. Last unit, we talked briefly about the Manila, Philipp Manila, the city in the Philippines. It is the most densely populated city in the world. So here's what you'd see on a typical average Manila street. It has a population density of 111,000 people per square kilometer. In one kilometer is 0.62 miles. So that gives you an even bigger number of people per square mile. The population density of, the Man of Manila in the Philippines is absolutely an extreme in the world. So if we look at this map, we see the population density of the entire Philippines island chains. And of course, we see greater concentrations here in the area around Manila than we do in certain outlying areas that may be jungle or other areas that are uninhabitable by humans. So the population of the Philippines is not evenly distributed because there are population densities that vary throughout the island chain. So take the time to practice yourself. Find the population density for the following cities. London, England. Okay. So I'll walk you through this first one. In London, England, there are 8.714 million people. We divide that by the land mass of the city of London, which is 670 square miles, and we get approximately 13,000 people per square mile. So that's the population density of the city of London. So look yourself for the population density of the city of Byron, the city of Hong Kong, as well as the state of North Dakota. And you're going to get drastically different numbers that represent population densities. These are things that geographers study in locating how many schools are necessary, how many water and sewer system treatment plants are necessary, so on and so forth. Another part of demography that geographers study in order to understand human populations is population change. So population change can sometimes be looked at through the crude birth rate of a certain area. The crude birth rate is the number of live births per 1,000 people alive in any given society, whether that's a society of a state, a city, a county, a country, a continent, etc. So the crude birth rate is really just the total number of live births in a year for every 1,000 people alive in that society. A CBR, or crude birth rate, of 20 means that for every 1,000 people in a country, 20 babies are born over a one-year period. So here we can see the world birth rate, births per 1,000 population, in the year 2009, as evidenced by the source of the map. So we see that countries in sub-Saharan Africa, over 50 babies were born per 1,000 people in many parts of Africa, whereas in parts of Europe and parts of North America, we see a much lower crude birth rate. So this helps geographers understand how population is changing in certain areas. Another thing that looks at population change is understanding the crude death rate. The crude death rate is the number of deaths in a year for every 1,000 people alive in a society. The CDR is expressed by the annual number of deaths per 1,000 population. And here is a map showing the crude death rate around the world for the same year, 2009. So in the last map, we saw that Sub-Saharan Africa had a very high crude birth rate, many people born per 1,000 per year. However, they also have a very high crude death rate. So that tells you that even though there might be a lot of babies being born and people dying, their population may be steady. Whereas in Europe, you see a similar pattern. And in North America, we see a relatively low birth rate, but we also see a relatively low death rate. So crude death rate and crude birth rate are just two indicators that show population change. There are many other things to look at in considering the demography of a society and understanding its population change. One of those things is to look at its population structure. In understanding the structure of a population, we can look at the natural rate of increase, which is the percentage by which a population grows in a given year, 
It's computed by subtracting the crude death rate from the crude birth rate after first converting the two measures from numbers per 1,000 to percentages. But we also look at things in population structure, such as the total fertility rate. Geographers use the total fertility rate to measure the number of births in a society. The total fertility rate is the average number of children a woman will have throughout her childbearing years, roughly ages 15 through 49. To compute the total fertility rate, demographers assume that a woman reaching a particular age in the future will be just as likely to have a child as are women of that age today. Thus, the crude birth rate provides a picture of a society as a whole in a given year, whereas the crude, or excuse me, the total fertility rate attempts to predict the future behavior of individual women in a world of rapid culture change. The total fertility rate of the world as a whole is about 2.6, so 2.6 babies born per woman in the entire world, but the figures vary greatly between most developed and least developed countries. The total fertility rate exceeds 6 babies per woman in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but in parts of Europe, it's less than 2. Population structure also looks at the infant mortality rate. That's the annual number of deaths of infants less than a year old for every 1,000 live births. The global distribution of IMRs, or infant mortality rates, follows the pattern that by now has become familiar. The highest rates are in the lowest developed countries of sub-Saharan Africa, where the lowest rates are in Europe. Another thing to look at is life expectancy. Life expectancy at birth measures the average number of years a newborn infant can expect to live at the current mortality rates. Like every other mortality and fertility rate discussed thus far, life expectancy is most favorable, favorable in the wealthy countries of Western Europe and North America, and least favorable in the poorest countries of Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. Babies born today can expect to live around 80 in Western Europe, but only to about 50 in Sub-Saharan Africa. In looking at all these numbers and indicators of birth rates, death rates, babies, life expectancy, etc., there are also several population issues that demographers and geographers alike take a look at. They look at the standard of living in a certain area, usually a nation. That's the amount of wealth and material comfort in the community or nation. And we can use that as an indicator to determine how long or short a person's life may be based on their standard of living. The standard of living also takes into account what we call poverty. Poverty is the continued state of low income and standard of living below the norm. The norm in the United States is very different than the norm in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Whereas you could survive on a few dollars a day in Sub-Saharan Africa and probably live above the poverty line, surviving above the poverty line in America means something very different. You need several thousand dollars to be above the poverty line. Also, migration is another population issue. It's difficult to measure populations when there's a movement of people for a specific reason on a large scale. For example, seasonal reasons, jobs, war, famine, and increase of standard of living and education are all reasons that people migrate from one area to another. So, for example, the countries of Sudan and Somalia are having trouble gathering information or accurate information about their populations as war and famine have caused large migrations of their populations. So let's take a look at some graphics in reference to understanding these issues in population. The UN Human Development Report creates an index. So the greater the, in, the greater your number is closer to one, the more developed and a better ranking that you have in the world. So this shows the development of human society um, in your specific country. Um, Norway is, of course, ranked number one, as it has a number very close to one. So the gray shows the income per person, which is a part of the scale. Another is expected years of schooling. Usually the more schooling a population has, the better off the, the entire society is. The average number of years that people go to school, so those two things are balanced, as well as the life expectancy. So these four things are plotted and added together, and then we get a ranking of human development index. So this just shows select countries, um, and so Norway was at number one the last time this um, ranking was shown. The United States was ranked number four, so there are a few countries in between that. And then all the way at the bottom we have countries such as India, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, and Congo, which is the last country or the lowest ranked country in the UN's Human Development Report. 
So that shows standard of living. Standard of living is high, highest in Norway.